There we go. And let me get the slide going. Here is our array of incredible speakers. Uh, we have Dr. Ken Mayer kicking us off wearing, everyone wears multiple hats. Ken wears multiple hats on top of multiple hats. He's with Harvard, Fenway, and many other uh, jurisdictions and many other affiliations he can tell you. Uh, and then we're gonna follow that up with uh, John B. Jaguna with FHI 360 and Mosaic. Uh, Julie Fox dialing in from the UK this morning. And then we have a great tag team of Dr. James Aiko and Catherine Koss from UCSF and Camry. And then last but not least, by any stretch of the imagination, is the uh, you know, indefatigable Ace Robinson, who will close us out for this webinar. I am going to um, stop sharing my slides. Hold on a second. Why is that doing that? OK. And now that I have got that organized, I am going to uh, welcome Ken to the virtual podium. And you can share your slides, Ken, and go ahead and get us started today. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, thank you, Jim. Can you hear me OK? We can perfectly. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Um, first of all, I just want to express my own uh, sadness at our profound loss of Dawn Smith, uh, who I've known for more than 30 years. She was uh, initially a project officer of one of the first studies of HIV in women that is a privilege to be part of and uh, project officer for uh, PEP and PrEP studies, uh, a really profound loss for our community. Um, uh, and I think Jim really eloquently expressed uh, how um, important Dawn was. Now, can you see my uh, slides? They're not in presenter mode yet, but. We can see them, Ken. You just need to pop them into slideshow or presenter yeah. mode. Yeah, yeah. Okay, actually didn't start at the start. There Are you go, here? thank you. <laughs> okay, miracles of modern technology. So I'm gonna just provide a very quick overview about what we know about uh, post-exposure prophylaxis. Um, first and foremost, uh, defining it. So it's the use of therapeutic agents uh, to prevent infection following exposure to a pathogen. So there's PEP for many other things. So for example, hepatitis B, uh, there's, there's PEP. So it's not just uh, specific to HIV, but the first and most important thing is to um, characterize the type of exposure. So with HIV, um, certainly needle sticks can transmit HIV. Splashes are really rare, bites are really rare. Uh, so it's really mainly needle sticks and sexual, but uh, the guidance does talk about deep contact with uh, other bodily uh, fluids. Uh, and what's important about HIV and the reason why PEP has been such a hard area to study is that HIV transmission is a high consequence, low probability event. It means that if you have one exposure, one, one uh, shared needle, one needle stick, one sexual exposure, the likelihood of becoming infected that one time is low, but it's not zero. So you can see here uh, the relative uh, rates of transmission. And these are really not exact numbers because we ethically can't do a study and say, let's prick this person with um, uh, a needle that is uh, infected with HIV uh, 100 times and see how soon the person gets infected. So it's, it's all based on retrospective recall about people's various exposures. But it gives you a relative sense, and that's the important thing. Uh, and we know um, epidemiologically that Receptive anal intercourse, for example, is the most efficient means of HIV transmission. Um, and um, other than uh, vertical uh, transmission, uh, um, transmission uh, from a parent to child, uh, which, which is high, but fortunately uh, with testing and with access to antiretrovirals, that uh, is uh, very uncommon at this point in time. But there are a variety of different risks. But again, none of them are uh, high enough where uh, you can easily do a study and follow 100 people and say, oh, the rate of infection uh, using uh, regimen A is uh, better or worse than regimen B. So the literature, as you'll see, is very much based on uh, observational studies and on animal studies. Uh, the first study that was done looking at post-exposure prophylaxis for, um, against HIV in humans uh, was done by the CDC uh, many years ago now, 25 years ago, 
And they looked at what were the predictors of why somebody who was a healthcare worker who had a needle stick exposure, why did they become infected with HIV? And they found uh, the, the um, first three um, risk factors, independent risk factors, really were sort of surrogates for high amount of exposure to infectious uh, uh, blood. In other words, a deep injury, or if there was blood on the device, if the device was in an artery in particular, uh, that increased the risk as opposed to uh, nicking uh, the skin. Uh, back in the bad old days where AZT was the only drug available at that time, uh, uh, they found that somebody who was very sick uh, with uh, HIV and that sort of surrogate for high viral load, so higher concentration of virus in the source was associated with uh, increased risk of transmission. And then what was very important was they found that healthcare workers who used AZT after needle stick exposure uh, had an 81% decrease. Their odds ratio was 0.19, 81% uh, decreased risk of becoming HIV infected. So this really is a lot of the basis for a lot of what we think about post-exposure prophylaxis. There were animal models, and the animal models suggested that if the medication was given within 24 hours, there was a very high level of protection. I mentioned that this um, healthcare worker um, uh, odds ratio uh, was useful information. And then one of the big questions everybody has, what about two drugs, what about three drugs? There really is no direct human evidence that um, three is better than two is better than one, but sort of logic sort of suggests that. And the concern that somebody uh, uh, might be a, a source for infection, might, be, um, might have resistant virus, uh, makes people lean towards giving more medication. But I think the field really changed as better tolerated medication, single drug uh, combination therapy became available over the last uh, few years. And the other point worth noting is there are case reports of people who became infected despite three drug uh, PEP. So we can't say it's 100%, but uh, we don't have the precise number, but we think it is highly effective based on these lines of evidence. Um, what about non-occupational post-exposure prophylaxis? Because all the human data up till now is really based on healthcare workers, but what about people who are exposed sexually? So there are two studies from Latin America there was a Brazilian study, again, not randomized. This was just observing uh, people um, after sexual assault and finding that the people who um, were able to access post-exposure prophylaxis uh, were much less likely to become HIV infected uh, than people uh, who did not access uh, PEP. So that's one, one line of evidence. And then there was a study, <clears throat> excuse me, in Argentina in men who had sex with men. Uh, and again, much higher rates of uh, transmission in people who did not access uh, PEP than people who did access PEP. Now, these studies are not perfect because you can say, well, the people who uh, access post-exposure prophylaxis might be um, differently behaved. They might be um, less, uh, uh, have uh, fewer risk. They may, they may uh, uh, be particularly adherent to medication as it's real world data. But these are the data we have, but they certainly are consistent with the animal data and with uh, the healthcare worker data. So there's no reason to suspect that PEP does not work. We just don't have the precision uh, that we'd like uh, from say a randomized controlled clinical trial. So two of the other big questions are, uh, when, do you, when do you start PEP? And, and the animal data says the sooner the better. Uh, the animal data suggested that between 24, 36 hours would be the ideal window. Uh, this has been expanded to 72 hours. That's not a magic number. Uh, it's, it's just sort of thinking about um, uh, feasibility in different settings, but clearly the message from the animal data is that the sooner you can start post-exposure prophylaxis, uh, the better. And that's why the CDC guidance has this line, uh, PEP should be initiated as soon as possible, preferably within hours rather than days. So really we don't wanna wait if somebody has been exposed. And then the other question is how long should it be administered? And again, we don't have human data where we compare different uh, durations of um, uh, use of medication. What we have are the animal data, and the animals that uh, received 28 days of post-exposure prophylaxis, there were zero, uh, zero new infections, whereas uh, only three days of PEP, half the animals became um, infected. So certainly uh, this helps inform uh, the sense that 28 days makes sense. Uh, now, again, so the regimens that were studied back then were not necessarily the same as the potent regimens we have today. So one could argue that you might be able to get by with less with um, an integrated strand transfer inhibitor uh, medication like valutegravir or bictegravir, but we don't know that for a fact. So the recommendation is still for 28 days of post-exposure prophylaxis. 
And then in terms of the regimens, uh, the rationale for three versus two drugs, it's, it's based on extrapolation, the observational studies, uh, not head-to-head -head clinical trials. But the newer drugs are clearly better tolerated, uh, but some of the newer drugs are better tolerated than others. And certainly the boosted PI regimens did cause um, um, more side effects. One drug that should be avoided for post-exposure prophylaxis is nevirapine. Uh, that was associated actually with uh, liver um, function abnormalities and uh, significant hepatotoxicity in people who are not HIV infected. So that's one that should not be on the list. Uh, clearly the guidelines say that now that we have so many single uh, pill regimens, that should be the mainstay. Uh, the recommendations are more towards uh, tenofovir-based regimens, uh, but certainly AZT, 3TC is an alternative. I mean, for example, somebody who has renal uh, issues. And the third drug is um, um, an integrase grant transfer inhibitor that's preferred. And many of the official guidelines talk about raltegravir or dolutegravir. Uh, they, they list darunavir as an alternative, but there are data on bictegravir that look good. And uh, uh, we did some studies at Fenway uh, Health over the years, uh, the health center that uh, has a focus on sexual gender minority populations. And we've always had a hotline for people who uh, are calling it about uh, potential exposures to HIV. And we compared uh, Bictegravir, FTC, and TAF, so single tablet pill, with a, a, a protease inhibitor regimen with AZT, 3TC, that, that's from um, earlier, earlier days. And also we had done studies with Raltegravir given twice daily, and also with um, l vitegravir boosted with Covisystat, FTC, and TAF, so uh, quad pill. And um, basically, you can see in the first column, uh, the rate of uh, adverse events tended to be lower uh, in most settings with uh, the big tegravir regimen. We've not um, studied dolutegravir, but there certainly are other studies uh, showing that that is very well tolerated as, as well. So these are among, uh, I would say, among the preferred regimens. Well, tegravir is a perfectly good regimen, just uh, some people have concerns about the BID uh, dosing, so there may be more missed uh, pills. So just to, to wind up, uh, and I look forward to questions and discussion, uh, Key take-homes are that there certainly are multiple lines of evidence that suggest that HEP can decrease HIV incidence, but uh, there's no definitive um, randomized control trial. The guidelines recommend uh, to do it within 72 hours, but sooner the better. Uh, using a third drug it probably makes uh, sense, and um, uh, the earlier regimens were not as well tolerated, uh, so INSTI regimens are preferred. And following a 28-day course of uh, uh, ART for post-exposure prophylaxis. Certainly the transition to PrEP uh, is a very important one. So I will wind down, Jim, and stop sharing and happy to answer questions or wait till the discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Ken. As ever, a fantastic presentation. Um, very grateful for that. Thank you. Um, do we have any clarifying questions? Uh, you can raise your hand. Yes, we'll take one. And Jerome, it is you. Please unmute, put yourself on video and ask your question. Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Roman Montgomery. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, I just have one general question. Um, you know, I saw the first slide when you talked about, I guess, the, the, the prevalence of, of transmission when um, you know, the needle sticks or, and, and the various modes of transmission. And I wanted to know is among practitioners, has there been a shift in the usage of PEP? And then, for example, um, my own daughter had um, she works in a, a, a dermatology clinic, and after a procedure on a client, uh, she was stuck by a needle. And she had called me, and I told her, you know, immediately, you know, go, you know, I asked her, if the, you know, what what her clinic said. Did they talk to you about, you know, post exposure prophylaxis? And uh, she, she said that they didn't. They just basically told her that a client, uh, you know, was low risk. Uh, they didn't have a procedure in place, you know, to test the clients or anything like that before a procedure. Uh, but not only did she, you know, uh, you know, was it not discussed, it was, it was even discouraged. And it took, uh, you know, two, two different visits to emergency rooms before she would actually be able to get a doctor that would provide it. Um, and even at that point, it was like strongly discouraged, you know, of course, talking to her about the you know, the potency of the, of the regimen and, and the side effects that can be impacted. And it even led me to question like, well, am, am I misdirecting her? You know, and I reached out to some of the providers that we've worked with, you know, here, and, you know, they, they kind of 
confirm that that would probably be the best route. But I guess I just wanted to get some sort of clarity because, you know, in this in that particular situation, like I said, not only was it not being discussed, it was even discouraged. Yeah, I know. It's an important point you raise. I, I think, it, you know, within the United States and I think globally, there's just a lot of heterogeneity between uh, clinical practices and, and the extent to which health care facilities are knowledgeable about PEP. I think it should be a standard part of occupational sa health and safety. Um, and I think the, the right thing in this case would be that if, if the um, source was thought to be low risk, uh, that um, a, a, a rapid test be done as soon as possible. Because uh, certainly if the source is known to not be HIV infected, there's no reason for PEP. So certainly, you know, first principle is uh, knowing the status of the source. But if there's, uh, if you're not sure of the status of the source, then we're in this gray zone of making um, guesstimates. And I think that's always dangerous because I think we can't um, know necessarily everything about uh, an individual's uh, source, individual's risk. So in that setting where there was a needle exposure, um, I think uh, if there's any anxiety, I think using uh, antiretrovirals makes sense if you can't be sure of the status of, of the source, given that the drugs we have available now are safe and well tolerated. We're talking about a 28-day course, and certainly um, even a low risk for HIV is something we'd like to prevent if, if possible. But the, the core would be the healthcare facility uh, to have uh, had a procedure in place to, uh, to ask the, uh, the source if they would be comfortable with doing rapid testing, at least uh, having that, uh, that available. Thank you, Ken. And we're going to take one more quick question from the chat, and then we're going to move on to our next speaker. And I have a whole bunch of questions, so I hope everyone can stick around. <laughs> and I'm sure there's going to be a lot more that are generated. But Dr. Juan Guanira in Peru is asking you, Ken, when should the control HIV test be performed after the conclusion of PEP? That's a great question, uh, Juan. Uh, the, you know, um, the, the thought is, probably not worth doing it before three months because what has also been reported in the literature is that uh, if somebody does become infected, but they have antiretrovirals in the body, even if uh, you know they're, they're not fully, uh, even if infection's not uh, um, you know, prevented, um, the virus will be suppressed. And so you know, if, you do it, if you do an antibody test, even if you do an antigen or RNA test, very often will be negative while the person is on PEP. Uh, so best to wait uh, um, um, several months. So the usual guidance is, is, is three months. Some people also like to do a six month visit. Uh, that's, uh, I, don't, I don't think most guidelines suggest that that's necessary, but a three month uh, follow up uh, I think is warranted. Thank you very much, Ken, uh, much appreciated. And thanks for the questions, both Jerome and Juan. Uh, I'm now going to invite Dr. Jambi Jaguna to the virtual stage. She will be sharing um, a policy analysis of PEP policies in Sub-Saharan Africa. There you are, Jambi. Hello. Hello, hello. How are you? Nice to see you. And feel, go ahead and you can go ahead and share your slides and feel free to get started. Thank you. Um, please confirm that you can hear me. I can hear you perfectly. All right. And are my slides coming through? They are coming through. Uh, you want to probably, there you go, presentation mode, you're set. All right. OK, so good morning, good afternoon, good evening, any, everyone, wherever you are. Um, I'm jumping to Guna. I work with FHI 360. And I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, PEP policy analysis and synthesis that we did in African countries that are currently participating in the Mosaic project, which works towards um, rollout of new PrEP products. So as a background, I think, one minute, let me just remove that from my screen. Okay. So um, guidelines from the WHO, I think we can all agree that, you know, they all, the, the guidelines recommend the use of PEP post-exposure prophylaxis by any person who is potentially exposed to HIV um, for the prevention of the same. And there's been lots of evidence, uh, some of it that you have, been, you have been shown by Ken just before me on how PEP has been preventing HIV as early as 1990, but it still remains underutilized. 
And um, in addition, we are currently having discussions around how PEP can play a vital role in HIV prevention on its own, as well as act as a bridge from potential exposure to uptake of other HIV prevention strategies, including PrEP. So our, our talk today is really going to talk um, and discuss our findings from the PEP policy analysis, which we synthesized in a PEP policy brief that is up on PrEP Watch and can be accessed through that link there. And it aims to summarize the PEP policy landscape within eight countries in Africa and illustrate how to address policy and implementation barriers within these eight countries, as well as recommend ways to increase access to an uptake of PrEP as part of HIV prevention. So in the, in the eight countries that we are talking about, we collected, we identified and collected 19 policies. Uh, we did this in partnership with country team members within those countries. And within them, we identified 17, which we could extract data around PEP within the countries and analyze them and then contextualize them in discussions within uh, with all the countries where we asked each country these three questions, whether the policies reflect what they know about the reality of PEP access and service delivery, um, what barriers PEP access had within their countries generally and specifically for adolescent girls and young women, and where the countries could see opportunities to strengthen PEP access generally as a whole, and for adolescent girls and young women specifically. So those are the countries that we sampled, that is Eswatini, Kenya, Lesotho, Nigeria, South Africa, Uganda, Zambia, and Zimbabwe. And as you can see, these documents were quite varied. Um, the earliest one was 2015, and the most recent was from Eswatini, which is still being drafted, the PEP section of their HIV treatment and uh, prevention guidelines. Um, the way we selected these guidelines is we picked the most recent guidelines within each country, and in places where there were more than one, we selected the one that was uh, most updated, that is the most recent. So our key findings, we looked at our findings in three, in four sections. Um, first is the PEP eligibility, uh, the timing for PEP, the drug regimens that are recommended, and the PEP and PrEP linkage between them. And when you look at the PrEP eligibility, WHO currently recommends that PEP should be offered to all who have potential exposure and potential for HIV transmission. And all the policy documents did um, align with that. Uh, there was no restrictions by age, no mention of parental consent uh, for those who may be under 18. Um, they all proposed the use of PEP by survivors of sexual assault, as well as those who may be occupationally exposed. Um, one, four countries out of the eight um, highlighted the need for PEP for those with other potential sexual exposure. And South Africa specifically called out um, use of PEP by those who may be exposed through injection-related practices outside of occupational settings. And it was the only policy that did so. Um, again, four countries um, did advocate for differentiated services for individuals based on the type of exposure, but six out of the eight countries did um, align with what WHO says that PEP should not be offered to individuals if the HIV status of the potential source is established to be negative. Three of them did clarify that if the potential source had had a recent exposure or may be suspected in the window period, then PEP could be considered. And one policy recommended use of ELISA testing if available. However, many of them, the rest were silent about um, the window period. So we had key recommendations, um, explicitly including people with injected injection-related procedure, potential exposures, actually does raise awareness and increases access to an uptake of PrEP, but we need to be more intentional. Uh, we thought that including individuals with non-occupational related um, potential exposure would be beneficial, such that we are not just focusing on clinicians, but also others who may be requiring that service outside of uh, clinical settings. Um, policies that are comprehensive and cover differentiated services for different types of exposures, as well as making PEP available for all seeking those services may also expand access. And then finally, the national policies and global recommendations. Um, when we are considering people who may have 
recent exposure um, or maybe in the seroconversion phase, though they may test negative, then they may not necessarily, even if we are able to, to you know, know their current exposure, we may not know their previous, um, their current status, we may not know their previous exposure. Thus, national policies and global recommendations expanding PEP for all who come for PEP, regardless of HIV status or potential source, may, ex may be beneficial. When you're looking at the time frame of um, provision of PEP, um, WHO says that PEP may be accessed ideally within 72 hours, and all the countries had that within their guidelines or policy documents, with slight differences where Nigeria had two documents within the same year, one stated 72 hours and one recommending between two and 72 hours. And then Uganda's policies clarifying um, a need for access within the first two hours of exposure. Our key recommendation was that potential users who benefit from a potential users may benefit from adoption of national policies that more closely align with WHO recommendations, where um, we have, um, though WHO does say uh, ideally within 72 hours, we know that it is most useful if it, if it is accessed much earlier on, the closer to exposure, the better for the person. At the same time, um, having some flexibility around the latest someone can access PrEP together with key information about the time frame in which PrEP can be provided, we think would help improve PrEP, PrEP, PrEP use and uptake. When you think about the recommended drug regimens for adults and adolescents, WHO does acknowledge that a two drug ARV regimen is effective but the three drugs are preferred. And you know, we, um, the two drugs which form the backbone of treatment is tenofovir and lamivudine or emtricitabine and with the preferred um, third drug of dolutegravir. And all the countries um, had that within their guidelines with a slight variation on the three drugs for Zambia. However, there were no provision for a two drug regimen in any of the policy documents that we reviewed. Our key recommendation was that as national policies are updated, policies that provide some flexibility to allow for a two drug regimen if and when needed, for example, if there are shortages, would be much more effective in helping people complete their PEP regimens as well as um, expand access. At the same time, keeping in mind that PEPFA, the biggest procurer of antiretroviral drugs in Sub-Saharan Africa, has moved on from procuring a 30-day uh, regimen of PrEP bottles and are now in 90-day regimen, which are ideal for treatment, but are not so aligned with PEP needs, which are for 28 days. Um, having a two-drug regimen would help countries align better because they can leverage on drugs that are already in place for PrEP. Thinking through linkages between PEP and PrEP, um, WHO recommends offering PrEP to individuals after completion of PrEP if they're HIV negative and their potential exposure is expected to continue even after they finish their post-exposure prophylaxis. So four countries out of the eight had documents that recommended connecting PEP and PrEP, but you know, um, they were not very consistent in where this PEP to PrEP connection was. In two of those countries, the connection was mentioned in the PEP specific section, in the other two, it was mentioned in the PrEP specific section of the guidelines. Um, and then three of those had recommendations for PrEP of being offered to people who are repeat users of PEP. Um, siloed, we think that um, siloed uh, PEP and PrEP guidelines and policies um, are hindrance towards um, PEP uptake. Um, establishing stronger PEP to PEP policy that support bidirectional referrals in service delivery is better able to help people make informed choice and increase access to comprehensive HIV prevention. And while repeated use can indicate people who do require PrEP, um, it doesn't mean that it should only be offered to people who are re repeatedly returning for PEP. By highlighting repeated use for PEP as a criteria for PrEP linkage, we may be missing out on people who are actually potential users of PEP and limiting it more broadly. And then expanding PrEP, PEP policies to allow for preemptive provision of PEP in special situations may actually be beneficial in filling key gaps for people who may wish to 
um, you know, um, access more HIV biomedical prevention and, and get more support and effective use of other prevention methods. For example, anecdotally within our discussion with the countries, we did learn that in some instances, um, adolescent girls and young women in South Africa may be requesting for um, presumptive provision of PrEP, sorry, of post-exposure prophylaxis as they come in to initiate PrEP when in doubt of their adherence, as they get used to taking daily oral PrEP, they keep some PEP to be able to help them in case they're not able to maintain adherence and get into the habit of taking PEP, of taking pre-exposure prophylaxis, so that in cases where they're not able to be adherent, but they're still exposed, they have the backup of PEP. Um, we had some non-policy barriers that came up during our discussions with the country teams, so we have barriers to PEP access and use, and specifically for adolescent girls and young women, um, country teams identified that traditional cultural norms and existing stigma did shape limitations to how adolescent girls and young women talk about their sexual encounters and ways to seek sexual health, which was compounded by lack of um, responsive centers to their needs and negative provider attitudes towards how an adolescent girl and young women may be exposed to HIV. And at the same time, the clinic hours and the school hours do not usually align um, to allow for them to access PEP when needed um, um, as they moved along. Uh, there's a whole list of um, findings. Um, I'll highlight some of them. Uh, for example, access barriers include some areas you didn't need testing requirements for access to PEP, which delays PEP um, engagement, especially if the, the providers who are allowed to test for these products or allowed to test for HIV in these countries and as specific cadres. When you're thinking about barriers to PEP use, um, gaps in follow-up to PEP adherence on lack of information on when PEP is appropriate and uh, limited provider knowledge were also cited. Um, so additional recommendations for these findings that are not non-policy barriers, we, we recommend that supporting sensitization training and mentorship efforts to familiarize not just the users, but also the providers as, of PEP as part of the comprehensive HIV package may address some of these barriers, as well as identifying testing and codifying models for community-based distribution to help PEP be more uh, you know, known within the community and point out opportunities for expanding differentiated service delivery for PEP post-exposure prophylaxis. And again, as other policy elements are strengthened to better support PEP access, we need to have complementary efforts to standardize monitoring and evaluation of PEP use and dispensation, because that's also another gap of um, PEP use that we identified that is non-policy. So in conclusion, our final takeaways was that, you know, key aspects of PEP, you know, PEP access presents very rich opportunity for improvement. And Within this document that, you, again, you can find through the link that is put here, um, we have a recommendation of 13 um, key things that countries can do to strengthen their policies so that we can improve PEP access as part of the comprehensive HIV prevention package. And that by leveraging this recommendation, various actors in the prevention space, including ministries of health, donors, implementers, could really be well positioned position to support uptake and integration and facilitate strengthened and sustained access for choice of PrEP. I keep saying PrEP because they're so interrelated in my mind, but I meant PEP. Thank you very much. Thank you for that uh, amazing analysis, John B. And I think your, your learnings from the sub-Saharan Africa context really apply to, I think, every part of the world that's uh, working on PEP. So thank you so much for that. Um, in the interest of time, uh, I'm going to move forward, but if people have follow-up questions for Jambi around her analysis or, or thoughts on these policies, please put them in the chat and she can answer you there. Um, I would like to now introduce Julie Fox. Uh, so Jambi said, you know, it was kind of getting confused between PrEP and PEP. It's very easy to say one or the other. Um, Julie Fox from King's College in London is going to talk to us about PEP in the era of PrEP. Um, and um, and uh, I think uh, I'm just going to turn it over to you, Julie, and to get us started. Thank you so much for being here today. Great. Well, thanks for inviting me and thanks for holding these webinars. This is the third one I've attended and they're incredibly interesting. 
Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, oh, I've gone, gone too far. There we go. Um, so today I'm going to talk about why, why is PEP needed in people who are on PrEP, the current guidance on PEP use and people using PrEP, and then discussion, discuss lessons that, that PrEP might maybe use to help us improve PEP use. So as we know, antiretroviral therapy is, is extremely effective in HIV prevention, and it started with PEP and then moved on to PrEP. And understanding how people can move from PEP to PrEP is straightforward and in a lot of guidelines. And we've discussed that already. Um, and actually, PEP is a perfect place to start PrEP in people who need it. But understanding when to take PEP in people on PrEP is not always as simple. And it's really lacking data because it's very difficult designed to studies to address these questions. And on a practical level, People prescribing PrEP are often not the same people as those who are prescribing PEP. And often PEP and PrEP services are not located together. So accessing the third drug in rural PrEP settings can be royally problematic. And getting the same recommendations as with the first question of the night said, we don't, partic patients don't always get the same advice depending on where they go. And so common questions in the settings we get are things like, can we restart two daily drug PrEP instead of accessing that third drug? What can the PrEP, and what can the PrEP service advise a person who needs PEP? So what's the immediate management before they have to cross to the other side of town to the PEP service? And also people on PrEP do tend to have tablets. They may have not taken them for PrEP, but what should they be advised to do after an exposure? And I'm gonna discuss a few of these things today. So is, first off, is PEP still used in the PrEP era? Well, it is. And this is data from Dean Street in London, which has one of the highest uptakes of PrEP in the UK. And this data only stretches up to 2017. But you can see that levels of PEP use were very high and dropped dramatically in 2017 when PEP use really got, PrEP use really got going. But they were still prescribing 75 packs a month. And now it's gone back up, it's doubled. So PEP is still being highly used. And there's reasons that people need PEP in the area of PrEP. Firstly, it could be people are actually on PrEP, but they missed their tablets, or they ran out of tablets, or they didn't realize they were going to have sex, so didn't have any pre-exposure PrEP. The second reason is that some people just simply don't want to take PrEP. So they don't see themselves at risk, or are they afraid of the stigma of taking prevention pills? And finally, and unfortunately, some people still do not have access to PrEP. Now, Ken has already talked about PEP efficacy, but I just wanted to touch on timing. Um, so effectiveness correlates with speed of uptake after sex. And as he said, there's not much evidence for taking PEP after 24 hours. And the unfortunate thing is, well, for the UK anyway, the average time from exposure to first dose of PEP is 24 hours. So half of people accessing it are accessing it after 24 hours. And despite numerous national campaigns, we haven't reduced the, the number of hours. And most guidelines do take, say, take up to 72 hours after sex. So how have PrEP experience changes our views on PEP? Well, we know PrEP is very effective, and that's despite, in some cases, dodgy adherence. And the on-demand on PrEP regime shows that PrEP taken around sex is highly effective. And we know within IPICA, lots of people miss the pre-coital dose or miss the post-coital dose, yet infections were very, very rare. So there is plasticity in this. So therefore, now, now is the time to really rethink PEP. What would a, would a shorter course, less than 28 days, be, be effective when we know that um, IPIGA regime works? And are three drugs really required? And we need trials now to explore this. Now, the trial evidence we have to date is, is of, of, of when is PEP needed to take, uh, when is PEP needed in people who are taking PrEP? Really for men, comes from the IPIGA study whereby it's recommended to have two doses before sex and two doses afterwards. 
or if you go back to the IPREX study, PK substudy showed that men needed four doses in the last seven days to truly prevent all infections. For women, there is really less and less data. There are no on-demand PrEP studies to facilitate the discussion. There are just PK studies. And the one that's most frequently cited is the HPTN 066 study, which recommends that women take, have to take PrEP six days before sex and seven days after, which is a hugely long time. And more recently, Cottrell's produced some PK results, which is a discussion in itself, which I think gives a really good argument for possibly reducing that recommendation for women and make it much more feasible for them. Now, at the moment, as we have already discussed, there are a few PEP guidelines which provide guidance on when to start PEP in PrEP users. The WHO doesn't have specific guidelines on this at the moment. The UK PEP guidelines do, but they're very rigid and they're very similar to what I've just described on the, on the previous slide. And we're just developing PrEP guidelines to be much more pragmatic to address questions like, what do you do if I've, got, if I've had sex and I've only got two tablets, two drug pills available? So these are the UK current guidelines. If people are on daily prep and they've had, for anal sex and people have had less than four pills in the last seven days, then it's recommended to take the 28 days PEP. For on-demand prep, if any of those four tablets are missed, prep, PEP is recommended. And for women, if people have less than six tablets before sex in the last seven days, then again, PEP is indicated. But as I've done talks around the UK recently, We've really, it's become increasingly clear that this doesn't really happen. There's a mishmash of recommendations. Some people are recommending patients take a double dose straight after sex or simply restart the two day drug prep as soon as they, people have had sex. So the guidelines are out of date and I think they're out of date pretty much everywhere. And this, here's some cases to discuss when you go back to your settings um, because really, they, they are all indicated to take PEP, PEP for 28 days, but would you really? So I've just highlighted the red, red ones just for discussion. So a woman had condomless sex yesterday and she'd taken four doses in the past week and those were in the last four days. You know, does she really need 28 days PEP? And at the moment, the indication would be yes. But what if she just continued, started daily Truvada, two, two tablets from then onwards? And then secondly, a man taking on-demand PrEP had his pre-coital dose and one post-coital and then was late for the final fourth tablet by 12 hours. Would you start 28 days of PEP? And at the moment we would. Um, and it's a grey area and it seems like an awful lot to expect someone to take 28 days of three drugs in that setting. So those are food for thought. And finally, can lessons from PrEP improve our PEP use? How can we reduce the time to first dose? Well, PrEP has shown us that people at home can self-start PrEP safely, either for on-demand or daily. So why can't they self-start PEP? Is it possible to take a shorter course of PEP? And again, are three drugs needed? So looking at taking self-start PEP, we carried out a randomized study in the UK of medium risk MSM, and they were randomized to either have a five day PEP pack at home or to access PEP through standard of care if they'd had unprotected sex. And you can hear, see here that the, in people given the self start home PEP packs at home, the average time to first dose was 7.6 hours, whereas in the standard of care arm, it was 28.5 hours. So having a self-start PEP pack improved the uptake by 21 hours, and that's going to have a big impact on efficacy of PEP. So less than 28 days. For men, on-demand PrEP data suggests that, especially if the first dose is very, very close to sex, then this is des desperately, definitely a possibility. But that as as we said earlier, the macaque data suggests 28 days is needed. This was using older regimes. 
So I urge you to develop an efficacy study. And two drug PEP. The rationale for three drugs is really from starting ALT in HIV infection, but even that's moved on. In treating HIV, dolotegravir 3 tc is now regularly used as a powerful two-drug combination. So should two-drug PEP be explored again? And if so, if it's efficacious, then PrEP clinics can also prescribe PEP. And it also means that people at home could self-manage themselves from a PEP and a PrEP perspective. So in conclusion, PrEP and PEP are becoming closer and closer. When to initiate PEP needs review on an individual basis, based on PrEP adherence, type of sex and hours since exposure. Self-start, single or double dose, Truvada is a pragmatic option, but currently 28 days is what we're all giving. More data is needed. Thanks very much. And I'll take any questions. Thank you, Julie. Uh, really beautiful talk. Um, so glad you were able to join us for this. Uh, do we have any uh, quick follow-up question? I see a question from Jingling. Jingling, would you go ahead and unmute yourself and ask your question? Thank you. Uh, this is Jing Jing Li. I am from uh, USCDC, uh, working in the HS, uh, STP. I was just curious about the guideline that you showed on our slide that uh, BASSH prep, so among prep users, um, sometimes when there are cert missing certain dose or underused certain doses, and then PAP is recommended. I was wondering, are they are there any evidence to support that recommendation? Uh, is there any evidence to support which recommendation? Sorry. When PrEP user miss some doses, they need to take PAP. Um, I just wonder if there is any evidence, like clinical or any other evidence to support that. Yeah, yeah, no, there isn't any any clinical evidence at all. And this is this is the gray area about moving between PrEP to PEP. And it's something that really only at the moment drug level studies can address. Um, but but they're not ideal. But there seems to be, it's, at the moment, we're very absolute. Like if you miss one dose of your PrEP, then you have to take PEP. And for me, that seems to be very extreme. And we need to have a, a I think the WHO needs to have a, a, a working group to look at how to interpret all the PK data that we've got. And there's more and more emerging to, to address how we can advise people to transition because the guidelines aren't practical and they're not really what happens um, at ground level. Um, so we need some consistency, but data is needed obviously to provide that consistency. Thank you, Julie. This is a very good clarification. I appreciate it. Thank you, Julie. And I'm going to take the moderator's prerogative and ask you one more question before we move on to our tag team duo of James and Kate. Um, I think this is from your own work. You mentioned the self-testing and having, uh, or having, you know, um, uh, a self-test and being able to, to start PEP at home, having like that starter kit. But I, the, I shared a link from AIDS map um, on your work that showed that even though people had it at home, there was still a lot of folks who weren't starting it, didn't recognize the fact that they may need PEP. So what are your thoughts on that? Uh, even when PEP is like right at home in front of you sitting there, there's still this gap between uh, people actually utilizing it. What are your thoughts on that um, perception gap? Well, I mean, that is something that social science would have been absolutely invaluable to investigate in that study. Um, and COVID got caught up and prevented it. Um, and when we looked at those missed opportunities for, for taking PEP, um, it was really limited to a small number of people who had many opportun missed opportunities. So it would have been good to have interviewed those people. It wasn't uniformly spread across the whole population. Most people took PEP when they needed it and appropriately. And then these few people who actually should have probably been on PrEP, and everyone was offered PrEP in this study. They were given PrEP or PEP. They didn't take either. Yeah. 
so so yes that's that's the the big area that we need to you know, we need to those people are having no prevention thank you for that and i really appreciate the clarification right and it's good to hear that most people while they had it accessible and they actually used it and it was actually a small number of people who missed it frequently mm -hmm. um but certainly trying to understand what was going on there um, would be critical. And, and you know, if there's any social scientists on this call or you know anybody, get them going on this. This would be something that would help all of us. Because I think uh, a big issue with PEP, right, is just acknowledging that you may have been exposed, actually taking that in, understanding that, and then all the steps you have to do to kind of get it. Um, but that first step is actually a pretty big hurdle for some people and trying to figure out how we can crack that nut would be um, amazing. So, so we thought that in the UK, that self-starter PEP would be a really great thing to give these five-day PEP packs out for people who thought they didn't need or didn't want PrEP. But the packaging of PEP has changed in the UK now that it's only 28-day supplies. It used to be a five-day, then a 23-day. So uh, how I would think previous speaker was talking about how pet packs and treatment packs are produced and it really affects how you're going to deliver these different um, choices. That's right. Well, thank you very much. I, if there's other questions for Julie, please go ahead and put them in the chat and we will have time for some follow-up questions at the very end. But I wanna get to our next speakers. I mentioned the tag team duo. Um, Dr. James Aiko and uh, Catherine Koss uh, are going to talk about missed opportunities uh, with PEP in uh, Eastern Africa. Thank you so much both for being here. Your slides look great. Go for it. Thank you, Jim, and thank you, Trevor, for having us uh, make this presentation, for inviting us. So we are going to talk about possible missed opportunities in reducing um, in reducing new infections uh, using PEP. Uh, so we'll be making this presentation from uh, lessons that we've learned from the such studies. I'll be making this presentation with my colleague, uh, Catherine Kors uh, from UCSF. So by way of background, uh, PEP uh, was developed decades ago, as, as Ken has highlighted, as a biomedical prevention option. However, it remains underutilized and has been, and that has been the case for decades, especially in low and middle income settings. It has largely been reserved for occupational exposures among healthcare workers. And so the question is, why? advanced an argument for expanding PEP. We suggest three uh, uh, reasons here. That one is that it's the only prevention option uh, available for adults that can be started after versus before HIV exposure. And secondly, uh, the current INSTI-based uh, PEP regimen, they are well tolerated and can be delivered outside of our occupational uh, exposure settings, uh, including in rural settings uh, where when we address uh, operational barriers. And lastly, that you can think of it as a gateway to other prevention options for persons with ongoing exposure or as a bridge for persons who have a needs for short-term protection. So lastly, Collectively, you think about including more options can enhance the success of uh, the prevention armamentarium when we aggressively uh, use PEP. As Jim had, had mentioned at the beginning of the call, the issue about neglect of PEP as uh, an armor in the prevention war. So what would be the rationale of increasing the space for PEP? We know that PrEP is expanding in generalized uh, epidemic settings, but additional prevention options are required for certain scenarios. So in, with individuals with anticipated periodic high-risk sexual exposures, there is space for PEP. 
and in Africa, awareness and access to PEP for sexual exposures are limited. So we embarked on a pilot study within the SEARCH studies. So SEARCH stands for Sustainable East African Research in Community Health, a study conducted in rural Southwest Uganda and Western Kenya. The, P, the principal investigators are Dr. Kamia, Dr. Havland, and Dr. Peterson. And the overall goal or aim of the study was to reduce HIV burden and improve uh, community health. That's the general goal of the studies. So within the test and treat trial, we conducted population level HIV testing with universal access to PrEP uh, for persons at elevated risk of HIV acquisition. We decided <clears throat> or designed it in such a way that we would have same day start uh, when uh, uh, risk is identified and participant is amenable to start PEP, uh, PrEP, and then we offered a flexible uh, person-centered um, delivery mechanism for participants to address barriers to access. So the observations that we made while offering PrEP uh, among some of our participants was that over time, um, a daily pill uptake was an issue. So pill burden uh, was an issue, and so fatigue crept in over time. And then there were people who reported less frequent potential ex HIV exposure over certain long periods of time, say like uh, three months. And then there are those cases that experienced exposures that were less predictable and unplanned for one-off exposures. So the question becomes, can, can we start prep? Uh, uh, can we time prep ahead of certain events in heterosexual relationships? Uh, so we saw certain situations like one of uh, sports days that may be associated with high risk uh, behaviors, uh, an individual who has stopped prep and then the spouse returns home without notice yet the spouse is reported to, this, to be the source of risk. And then individuals uh, who engage in alcohol use may, um, may take too much sometimes and then have sexual uh, encounters with sex workers or bar mates. And all this within a context where in some cases the two and one of PrEP on demand may not be an option. Um, so could PrEP be uh, the preferred uh, option for some of these individuals within certain contexts or periods? So by way of methods within the search trial, we conducted a pilot PEP uh, study in five communities in Kenya and Uganda between 2018, December and May of 2019. Conducted community sensitization as well as training of our healthcare providers and leaders. Our PEP package included a seven day access um, with a hotline to access to ask questions to providers whenever participant was in question, and then options for out of facility uh, delivery of medications just to enhance convenience for for participants. So this slide summarizes our results. We enrolled 124 participants who sought PEP. A third of them were male and a quarter of them were less than 25 years old. 41% were from the fish, fishing uh, industry, so they were fisher folk. And in terms of exposure, 20% reported exposure to a non serodifferent partner and acknowledge that as their risk. And 72% had reported uh, exposure to risk from a new or an existing relationship. 7% of our participants reported transaction of sex as their exposure risk. In terms of visits, 12% of all visits were conducted at out of facility sites with 35% of our participants having at least more than one of their visits conducted outside the facility. So this graph shows uh, retention adherence and HIV testing. As you'd see, it was pretty uh, reasonably high over the, the four week period. Um, and we 
continue to do testing for these participants at week 12, we had 88% testing as, as well as 83% testing at 24 weeks or six months after exposure. There were no SAEs reported, we only had four um, uh, mild um, adverse events that resolved them by themselves and we had no seroconverters. So what were the lessons that we learned? that PEP is implementable and useful beyond occupational exposure in rural Uganda and Kenya. And, sec and a patient-centered approach with flexibility would enhance convenience and improve engagement and uptake uh, of this uh, uh, intervention that would reduce infection. Secondly, there's an appeal for this option among individuals with occasional one-off encounters, and, and that presents an opportunity to potentially suppress new infections. So we found high completion and adherence rate at 20, of these 28-day costs, and, and maybe that's part of the motivation of using PEP as compared to PrEP in a regimen that you see the end of it as compared to PEP, uh, which may uh, someone at, 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 at risk started on PEP may have to go on for quite some time. So at this point, I'll invite my colleague Kate to go ahead. Wonderful. Can you hear me? Great. Thank you so much, James, um, and thanks for having us. Um, now we'd like to share with you some of our current work in the search collaboration, building on this PEP study um, led by James um, and adding PEP to PEP to expand choices in HIV prevention. So um, in the search SAFIRE study, we're currently testing multi-disease and multi-sector HIV treatment and prevention interventions. And we're conducting three ongoing randomized trials of a dynamic choice prevention intervention um, in three different settings, antenatal clinics, outpatient departments, and out of clinic community settings. And we're really focusing on offering um, various choices in HIV prevention, so specifically product choice of oral PrEP or PEP and the option to switch between these products over time. Um, we're offering PEP with a pill in pocket option, um, so several pills to have on hand, similar to what um, Julie has described. Um, so as having several pills on hand for a rapid start in the event of an exposure, having a self-test kit on hand. And and then um, contacting a provider as soon as possible to continue the 28-day course and have a rapid test right away. Um, we're also offering a choice of service location and preference for HIV testing, and then a focus on a multi-component approach to, to client-centered care. Um, next slide, please. So these are some of our um, preliminary data. Um, this is an ongoing study, but some prelim data from week 24 from our outpatient department trial. Um, and the top figure shows product choice. So PrEP is in dark green and PEP is in blue highlighted by the arrow. And what you can see, um, thanks. Great, thanks. Um, what you can see here is that PrEP was really the most preferred product at each time point, but a number of participants did select PEP over PrEP as their preferred prevention product. And we think this highlights that if clients were only offered PrEP, there would have been a missed opportunity to prevent infections in this group. And so offering PrEP alongside um, PEP together um, can increase prevention coverage. Next slide, please. So as this group knows, there is no one size fits all approach for prevention and we really need additional choices to serve all who may benefit from prevention. Um, PEP is underutilized as an entry point for prevention as well as other prevention options. Um, and as we have very exciting new options such as cab LA being scaled up, we really have an opportunity to offer PEP as a choice um, to meet HIV prevention needs. Next slide, please. We'd particularly like to thank our study participants, partners, funders, um, and AVAC and Jim uh, for inviting us. Thank you so much. Thank you, Kate and James. Uh, the dynamic duo, beautifully done. Um, we have time for a quick follow-up question. Does anyone have a question that they would like to ask? Uh, you can raise your hand. Otherwise, we will uh, make some time after our last uh, but not least presenter who is uh, on deck as we speak. Okay, so if you, uh, if you have questions, feel free to drop them in the chat as ever. 
And we'll again, um, when, when uh, our next speaker is concluded, we will open up the floor um, for some discussion with everyone who uh, remains. And I did mention in the chat, we may run a few minutes over, apologies for that. Um, but without further ado, uh, I would like to invite our last speaker of the lineup today, Ace Robinson, who has also worn, uh, wears and has worn many, many, many hats. He's currently the executive director of a HIV AIDS service organization in the Pacific Northwest here in the United States. It's very early where he is. So we're grateful, uh, Ace, for you waking up with us today. And uh, I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, and thank you for the invitation. Um, so um, as Jim said, I, uh, my name's Ace. Um, just quick, uh, uh, background. I use masculine pronouns. Um, I am in um, the Puyallup region of um, the present day United States, um, the southern lands from the Puyallup people um, uh, in present day uh, Tacoma, Washington. Um, and uh, feel free to uh, follow me on Twitter. If you have any questions, also feel free to email me. A little bit of background about me, making sure, like uh, as Jim said, I work at HIV service organization, and I spend a lot of time working on how are we going to take a lot of the policies that we've been speaking about and bring that to um, our community. Um, quick disclosures, my organization receives unrestricted funding from Vive and Gilead Sciences. So let's go back in time and talk about, this is the um, time period when PEP was shown to be efficacious. Um, uh, in the United States, uh, Bill Clinton was running for um, his second round as president. Um, the Fugees um, had taken over um, the, um, the uh, I would say a lot of parts of the world uh, with Killing Me Softly. Um, uh, uh, David Ho uh, was about to become man of the year for a lot of the work that um, uh, he worked with on his colleagues for um, uh, on, on proteus inhibitors. And then also uh, Nelson Mandela was weeks away from announcing that he was stepping down as uh, um, president of, of the Republic of South Africa. So I'm just giving you a little bit of context. I think the context part of this conversation is where we're going because we're talking about implementation and we're talking about how we're going to stop having conversations in, in clinical settings and public health settings and it not getting to real world settings. So I was very happy to hear a lot of the work that Julie Fox was speaking to earlier about uh, what is being done globally on, on implementation. So uh, what helped it, uh, what else happened uh, around that time period? Um, uh, we have Crixivan, it was Viramune is approved as the first uh, post-exposure prophylaxis regimen, right? Um, now, uh, Kim Ayer spoke a little bit about this earlier, but remember that this was only for clinicians who had an um, accidental finger stick. So we were talking about research about that was initially utilized um, specifically for clinicians. And why is that important? Because it's like we started with a, a population um, and excluded other populations who were also um, 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 at risk. So when we talk about a lot of the work that we do in the HIV field, we talk about meaningful involvement of people living with HIV and AIDS. Um, so or, or around MEPA or the Denver Principles or the, the Paris Declaration, all of it is the same that you have these, um, these regular uh, misses and our ability to take stuff from the research world to implementation world because uh, the most impacted communities weren't in the room. Um, and so like we know Proteus were inhibitors uh, were also shown to be effective um, in, in 1996, um, but that was a turning point in the HIV response for certain communities and it meant nothing to other for the vast majority of uh, people impacted by HIV uh, globally. So um, just real quick, I'm um, being in the interest of time. Um, this is a conversation about HIV pater um, paternalism. And PEP is just another example of HIV paternalism when we speak about who has access and who doesn't have access to a proven, um, um, uh, uh, to a proven prevention, um, uh, uh, proven prevention model. So uh, quite often the HIV response, uh, there's been a focus on babies, mothers, hemophiliacs, and, and clinicians, and PEP was no different. Uh, who was left out, uh, queers, uh, black, and uh, people from indigenous regions, people who are, uh, who are in, in this country, like native Hawaiian, Pacific Islander, and then also individuals who are using substances. 
Uh, one thing that we have seen, this is uh, what we, we know from um, uh, our, our work, is that the vast majority of people who acquire HIV today are coming from key populations, right? So like, if we're not, if we're not having a conversation about key populations, then we're really just spinning our wheels and talking to ourselves. So um, again, now remember this was 1996, uh, was uh, when PEP was approved for, um, uh, for, uh, for occupational exposure for people who had a finger stick. It took a good 20 years in, in the country that I'm in um, before we had real updated guidelines that were inclusive of all individuals who were um, potentially at risk for acquiring um, HIV from uh, lifestyle and from um, choices that may, they may or may not have control over, sex, um, uh, uh, substance use, so on and so forth. And so there's not like a lot of uh, doomsday conversations because I think we need to talk about what is possible and then talk about best practices. Because I like the conversations that we're talking about clinical trials and whatnot, but um, for someone like, so uh, to give an example of my background, uh, when I was serving as the um, uh, ED of an HIV, of a relatively small HIV clinic in Southern California, um, um, our small clinic um, uh, with, a, with appropriate uh, PEP information, marketing communications and, a pl and an action plan, was able to match the entire rest of the state of California when it came to um, uh, PEP prescriptions um, uh, for, for, for our communities, right? And so all we're saying is that all you have to do is align the planets and you can get things done. So I saw some questions in the chat box that I think are very important. Uh, when you talk about first is that Marcom is marketing and communications. How are you telling people about this? Because if you build it, it does not mean people are come, or will come. Because we do know that the number of individuals, like so speak to individuals who, um, who acquire uh, um, HIV and they, they realize that they had an exposure at a certain time, like at, at, at a very particular time point, but they didn't know PEP even existed. They just thought, well, I need to wait it out and see what happens. Uh, no, you have like this three-day um, period where you can start a course that would, can actually avert HIV acquisition. Um, and so like we need to start having conversations about sexual health clinics, primary health clinics, and emergency departments. Because if you're just going to focus on sexual health clinics, when the, the vast majority of individuals don't go into sexual health clinics until they acquire, um, until they're diagnosed with HIV or an STI, or um, that's when people often move into sexual health clinics that are more inclusive of, of, of these conversations, we need to really focus on our primary health folks and our emergency departments. Those standing orders, I heard someone speak about uh, a change in the UK, but well, a best practice is making sure you have a seven day course uh, with referral to one of these sexual, to your sexual health clinic and primary clinic. Why is seven day important? Seven days are important because people have lives. And so you wanna make sure that if someone was able to get into your emergency room on whatever day, their next day off where they can maybe potentially go see one of these, these uh, other clinics might be seven days later. So make sure that if you are giving someone, if you're giving someone a, a prescription on a Sunday and you're saying that their prescription is gonna run out on Friday, that's a problem. So we need to make sure, or Thursday, we need to make sure that they're going to get uh, seven days in order to get the rest of their 21 day referral. Do not require confirmed HIV negative tests beforehand because some individuals do not have time to wait based on your systems that you have in place. Uh, we do know from, like we can go through all the data speaking to uh, fears of, of, of uh, 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 fears that individuals will, will um, not be able to utilize the medication for a variety of reasons, whether they might become resistant if they are living with HIV or, or they might, um, or the medication just might not work for them. Well, seven days is, is uh, enough time or short enough time period that you can change, um, you can change their medication, change their course of care um, uh, without there being anything uh, detrimental to those individuals. And then comes the part where I'm going into the deeper weeds, which I think is really important. Getting that team of individuals outside of your staff who are going to care about this work, making sure like your outreach staff is connecting with clinical staff and making sure that clinical staff um, like understand that they have, uh, they are going to be a key player and the work that we're doing to avert HIV acquisitions in your community. Once you empower, say, medical residents, people who are younger in the field saying like, you know, the work you did in this emergency room um, um, helped this individual. Um, like, you know, making sure that we are uh, letting people know that this isn't just an, an added task, that this is actually making sure that someone's a part of a movement. And obviously your pharmacy partnerships are going to be absolutely vital. You have to make sure that it's, it's zero barrier, not low barrier, zero barrier for someone to acquire um, 
their script, their, their prescription after, um, after they have their confirmed HIV negative test. Because this is like the reality. When I'm talking about bringing people in and making sure they're part of a solution, one of these things that is, is so fundamentally um, problematic with the work that we do is that better care and better prevention options does not mean that we're going to have better results for all populations. Because going back to um, 1997 protease inhibitors, um, how many of us lost individuals uh, um, uh, after protease inhibitors were, uh, were um, were made available to some people in the world. We saw like like we saw people who were uh, well connected with healthcare, uh, who trusted healthcare, who had access to healthcare. That was where antiretroviral treatment was available. But then we start having these conversations about okay, well now that we have it, we're actually expanding the disparity between um, people who have versus the people who have not. Um, so being very clear, we're having a conversation. This is like a, a, a race, gender, sexuality conversation. How are we going to make sure that the individuals who are from those most impacted populations have even more access? Because uh, as, uh, as uh, James was saying earlier, have more access, whether it's a rural or urban settings. Because this is a slide from, the, from this is a slide about pre-exposure prophylaxis, talking about PrEP to need ratio. Um, we're in the U.S. Um, um, we're, we're in a country where uh, where white people are make up the vast, vast, vast majority of prep use um, and make up a paucity of the um, uh, make up a, make up a pos not paucity, but a, a very small relative amount of HIV diagnosis versus the flip for people who are black and people who are indigenous, Hispanic, Latinx in the United States. So I I don't actually know the data for post exposure prophylaxis in the U.S., but I. I bet it's even, it's even more stark because a lot of the PEP programs that I have seen are just now getting to be more inclusive of other populations. Because these are a lot of the pictures you see, like I just Googled this a couple of days ago. It's like I put in PEP to see images and Google images to see what popped up. And the first three sets of images were, were um, individuals who were of, 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 of perceived white background, right? But that doesn't have to be the case. Because now we're looking at what's coming forward. Like, you know, we're seeing people who are, it's more inclusive. Like, how are we going to um, have conversations so people can see themselves in, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the work that we're doing? Um, like, and then some of you are working in places where it might be hard for you to get inclusive imagery of people who might use substances, people who might be part of the trade sex industry, uh, people who uh, may be queer, people who might be uh, um, adolescent girls or young women, making sure that you're like finding a way to get around like that bottom left one. I was working at an institution that was very um, anti LGBTQ plus um, as a parent group, but as a clinic, we found a way around it to like um, find images that could still uh, relate to the community. So um, as, as a, a, a colleague and former boss said, um, uh, Linda Gail Becker, you can go over, under, around, or through people, but we have to find a way to get to the other side of these conversations. So this is um, our final take-home piece. I'd love to have a bit of conversation. Uh, so when you're creating that protocol uh, for high throughput, throughput environments, basically emergency departments, like when I have worked with ED, so I, I think Kim Mayer was on earlier, when I worked with like Leahy Health in Boston and creating their PET protocol, it was like, how are you going to reduce your, your pay, um, paperwork? How are you going to reduce the number of clicks? The clicks meaning for if you're typing into a computer um, um, at a healthcare center, like, you know, the doctors have to, people in emergency rooms have to do a lot of things. So you have to like be able to integrate this in a way that makes sense and doesn't require a lot of time. Um, and then like two question screens. Those two question screens um, often were like, um, um, at last sex, uh, um, what, um, do you know your partner's HIV status or, and, or, um, were you utilizing condoms? Um, and, um, at last time you, um, injected drugs, um, did you use your own paraphernalia or did you share? And if the answer to any of those questions, uh, can lead to the next question as well, like, do you, are you aware of your HIV status? If you are unaware of your HIV status or think your HIV status is negative, then we start the PET pro uh, protocol. And then we start worrying about those other things while the why that clinician has to get on to the next person who is also under an emergency situation. Keep it simple, keep it clear. 
um, our staff and en um, trained on engaging communities. That was part two of that conversation, making sure you're working with your emerging departments, making sure you're working with those primary health um, um, clinicians on uh, not um, treating individuals in the trade sex industry, um, sex workers um, and, and, uh, and, and, and appropriately, making sure that you're not um, treating LGBTQ plus people poorly, not you know, treating people who are using substances poorly. It's easier said than done. This is an iterative conversation. We know the biggest challenge for, um, for us in the HIV field is the clinicians themselves. Uh, we can stop talking about um, the patients being the problem. It's almost always the clinicians who are the problem. So especially individuals who might be coming to a, a clinician for the first time in seven or eight years, is that person going to be able to give them the care that they need? Um, I spoke about the Marcom strategy. It's, it's got to be inclusive. Find a way to do it. Um, it's real easy. We create it like that for bars, we created those those coasters that go on 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 bars to be like, oh, here's some information about PEP. And obviously that it, it worked, it worked, it worked. Our Sundays, Mondays, and Tuesdays were were packed with individuals uh, who were who were seeking out um, PEP PEP care. Um, and then craft metrics. Your metrics are going to be in, uh, very important because. We have the data, like, you know, this is something that I'd love to see someone put together for, for um, the next conference of like, oh, how well did their, did their PEP program work, right? And your PEP program, how you know it, it, it worked well um, is that you had that uptake. And was it differential based on demographic? If you're able to show that um, your most impacted populations, so speaking US talk, if you're most impacted, your Black, Latinx, Native Hawaiian, Pacific Islander um, populations are accessing PEP, then um, at, at a higher level, you're doing a great job. Um, like, so work that uh, um, like in, in Sub-Saharan Africa, are you able to in, engage queer individuals, adolescent girls and young women, period? Like how are you going to be able to do this work with people who do not feel, who do not um, get treated well um, uh, in some clinical settings to make sure they're care, cared for? And sorry, speaking quickly, I want to be mindful of time and leave time for questions. But remember this one last thing, public health is not rocket science because rocket science is much easier because like there's a there's a yes or a no, but public health, um, there there is a yes or no, but we choose um, to do it or not do it. So um, I'll stop there uh, for questions because I really want to drive into how do we stop having a conversation about research and bring this to the to the community. Um, so um, I haven't dove into the chat box uh, yet, but I will do so now. Thank you so much, Ace. Uh, and if you could stop sharing your screen, we can see everyone's beautiful face or at least their avatar. Um, beautifully done. Thank you for putting it in context and uh, so important. Uh, access means nothing if it's not getting to the people who most need it. And we need to be culturally literate in every sense of the word. <laughs> So I'm gonna invite all of our speakers to come uh, on screen, show yourselves, and we, we are uh, oh, really out of time. So I'm gonna just sort of pose something for you each to speak on ever so briefly. Um, it's, not a, it's not a brief answer, but I'm asking you to be brief at this moment. Uh, so we talk about PEP being neglected, and I'm also feeling another word right now is incredibly frustrated. Um, 72 hours, not really based on data. Um, it's not really, is it really helpful to have someone come in at 36 or 48 hours? Why do we keep saying 72 hours? Why do we keep saying 28 days when we have uh, emerging data from Ypres-Gay and other places that 28 days is probably not necessary, yet we put people through that ringer? And then the three drugs. And I know these things have come up amongst all of you in different ways. And I know there's sort of issues around doing clinical trials, but really, what the hell? How long can we continue to do this sort of subpar work on PEP and just sort of accept things that are not based in science, 72 hours, things that are changing, but we can't seem to change the recommendations. So I'm sharing this frustration and I, I want each of you to kind of go around and walk me off that frustration cliff and tell me how we are going to uh, collectively research science, public health, community, um, work to fix these things. Who wants to start on that? Otherwise I will call on you. 
I see Ken's, Ken is unmuted and so is Julie. So you're like ready to go, which one? I'm, I'm happy to start. Uh, you know, I, I think this, this webinar, I think has been really useful for me just reminding me about the questions you're raising, Jim. Um, we have representatives from the CDC and from WHO on the call. I think the other um, stakeholders uh, who, are, who I don't know if they're on the call would be industry. Uh, what, one of the reasons why PEP is an orphan is because it's, you know, a, whether it's 28 days, whatever, it's, it's one and done as opposed to, you know, PrEP or uh, HIV treatment, which are, you know, uh, potentially lifelong commitments. So there's kind of an incentive for industry to be more in the game. So it's been very hard to get industry to support uh, large PEP studies. But um, I do think we're in a different era uh, and this whole issue of the, the PEP PrEP transition. I think the search study data is really exciting to say it's PEP is part of a menu and it might be a one off. It might be introduction to PrEP, maybe cycling on and off. I think those are important questions. And I think at the very least, um, activist groups like AVAC uh, can um, kind of push our international and federal regulators to at least do some more convenings to see if we can really do a better job in providing guidance and then pushing out education to the community. Thank you, Ken. I see Julie on deck with her microphone unmuted. Um, you're next. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So, so the I like neglected and frustrated. Um, so I have looked into doing this efficacy studies around this recently with uh, David Dunn and Sheena McCormack, and basically you're looking at thirty thousand people minimum you needed for these studies. So it's the same problems that we had when we were designing. PrEP efficacy trials when you can't have a control or placebo arm. That, you know, we need to get some direction from regulators as to what level of evidence is needed in order to change the guidelines. Um, and I think that would be really helpful forum to, to bring together. Um, and, and I like Ken's point about industry, but, but you know, you're right, PEP and PrEP, they're, they're options. And a one drug combination that was available for PEP and PrEP might be attractive for a pharma company to develop, but I see that PEP on its own isn't. So I think industry, we have to get industry involved, but there is scope. Thank you, Julie. So I, I'm, I'm, oh, I see James just unmuted, you're next. Yeah, thanks, uh, very important questions, Jim. I think um, I'll respond to the second one on the three versus two. A drug regimen for for PEP. Um, uh, so our, our observation with participants as uh, in as much as people would prefer shorter regimen and is appealing in these rural settings in Kenya and Uganda, they report um, more severe in comparison more severe adverse events as compared to a, a two drug combination. So any attempt towards moving it towards a two drug regimen, I see a way in which that is, is going to be extremely appealing. And so we need <clears throat> to build up on that evidence to just demonstrate non-inferiority between the two and three drug, especially for, for PET. Thank you. Thank you. And it looks like Jambi is ready. Am yeah. I right? Go yes, ahead. I am. <laughs> I wanted to speak about the orphanhood of, of PEP and, you know, like trying to figure out what, what we can do to bring PEP back, pep, make PEP sexy again in a way. And I feel like it all comes down to, you know, demedicalizing PEP to some extent and thinking about it outside of how we traditionally started PEP. PEP. I keep saying PEP, my God. Okay, how we traditionally started talking about PEP, uh, you know, for occupational exposure, for sexual assault, and ignoring totally that people's lifestyles change and different exposures happen to different people at different times with different circumstances. In some instances, some of those may be covered very effectively with PEP. And letting people know that, you know, you have a multitude of HIV prevention options, including PEP because we often don't think of PEP when we think of HIV prevention as a whole. We are more reactive than preventive when we think of PEP. So it's a whole attitude change, thinking around, you know, pulling it into more firmly into the center of the HIV prevention toolbox and not leaving it out completely. Because I feel like the orphanhood was the medicalization of PEP 
and the thinking we had around it about um, who can access it. And a lot of that, I think, we came to the realization as we are doing the policy, uh, it's still quite medicalized. It, it is still quite medicalized. So it all starts from our mind as well. Thank you. Uh, and following up with that part of the conversation, um, this the the great success that we had with PEP was turning it into, a, this is part of your, your social life. Uh, this wasn't about medicalizing, this was, you, you had a you had a great weekend, um, but this is something that you need to um, make as part of your life to avert HIV acquisition. And it wasn't it, there was no um, it wasn't a complicated uh, um, ad campaign. Uh, very similar, like uh, Jim was part of a, a massive prep campaign that ran across Chicago that wasn't complicated. You don't need to make this complicated. It's just like if if uh, if you had a great weekend that um, that did not involve uh, condoms or or your own personal uh, syringes, well then this is part of this is part of your plan. Uh, we're not telling you, we're not shaming you, we're not we're not telling you what you have to do. We're just saying uh, come get this and keep it and keep it moving. Thank you, Ace and and Kate. You're gonna have the semi last word today. <laughs> Thanks, Jim. Well, I, I just wanted to first thank you for really bringing this discussion to this forum and galvanizing more interest in research, because I think you're right that um, there is a great need for simpler regimens, um, hopefully shorter regimens. Um, and I think also, you know, this really is a call to do more with what we already have in terms of our imperfect 28 day course and how can we make this, I think Ace brought up great points about you know, providers being a barrier. Um, how do we make this simpler um, for providers? How do we make it more accessible to community and individuals who may be interested? So I think there's a lot we can do with our very imperfect um, course of uh, 28 days for now. Thanks, Jim. And can I get my you last little put, call? Oh, go ahead, Ace. You, you, yeah. you can get so the if, second to second. Oh, last no, word. no, it's, it's not even the last word, just a, a call to action for anyone who might be in the, in the research space. An injectable PEP would be amazing like figure it out do it do your clinical trials da 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 uh ken who do you have to talk to make it happen um so uh, an injectable pep would be amazing you come in on monday get your shot and keep it trucking thank you ace and and with that i'm going to uh once again thank uh this wonderful array array of speakers ken john b julie james kate and ace Thank you to all of you for showing up today and participating. I appreciate you. Uh, we will be sending you a follow-up email with a link to the uh, resources. Um, that link is always available to you. So you, when you get there, you'll see that there's resources from all our previous webinars, uh, as well as our upcoming webinar. And that is again on December 14th. We're focusing on another neglected area uh, around inclusion of pregnant and lactating people and in clinical research and implementation research. It's high time we change that paradigm as well. We're putting together an awesome panel, so I hope you will be there. Um, and with that said, I am going to uh, officially close the call. Thanks again for being here, for hanging out a little bit late. And I hope you all have a great day or evening and uh, take good care of yourselves. Ciao.